welcome. Uh, I'm Jeff Baggett. I, I'm private practice in Edmond, Oklahoma, uh, which is a suburb of Oklahoma City. Just so all you people that show pictures of the lakes and beaches and things, this is taken in Oklahoma City at Lake Hefner. Uh, we have a lake here that a lot of people uh, has a lot of ocean going experience say it's very similar in that the wind directions can change so fast. And so this was a sunset here recently with some of the fires out in Oregon and Washington, and it was an orange uh, sunset. And so I was able to get that picture. Um, and I just wanted to show you that we even have, we even have um, beautiful sunsets and beautiful lakes in Oklahoma with our own very own lighthouse right there. Uh, if you have questions, you can write them in the chat box on the right, and we can go to those and discuss those at the end of the seminar. Um, and again, I'll be going for about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll have time for questions and we'll get everybody to go, uh, go do other things that, that are important. So um, my topic is cuss tips and re-engineered flat landing pads. I told you this was a picture taken at Lake Hefner and I am Um, it's a simple topic, but yet it's a very important topic. And um, I gave this talk to the American Equilibration Society. They asked me to give it to them, and I've given it several times here. And so um, we're going to talk about cuss tips and about flat landing pads and what you're doing with your crown and bridge and what we can do in predictability. We're going to talk about predictability because we at Panky, we, we want predictable things and we want um, occlusal schemes that work for us in our daily practice, and I'm all about daily practice. I'm in private practice, I told you, in Edmond, Oklahoma. Um, so those are some of the topics we're gonna to talk about today. And then my advancer is. So we're gonna talk about teeth. I promise you, we're gonna to get to teeth. But what I wanna to talk to you about is over the last year and a half or two years here, about what your experience has been with COVID. I want you to think about what you take away or what you took away from your experience. And, you know, I'm so sick of masks. Uh, I'm so sick of masks that we, we talk about the Delta variant coming back out. And so Dylan and I were talking before the session about, you know, they're, they're masking about it back at a panky indoors and stuff. Um, but, you know, what's, what was your takeaway from COVID? How long were you off? What did you learn from that experience and stuff that you are applying? Because, um, I've had several discussions with, with Mike Fling and with other dentists about, uh, you know, where we're headed. And, um, you know, I had some health issues the last couple of years, and, and so did Mike. And I'm telling you, at some point in your life, you're going to have those, those kind of experiences. And so what I took away from COVID-19 um, in my experience, first of all, we were out for seven weeks. We had to shut down for seven weeks. And um, that first week was really tough because I was chomping at the bit. And then I started kind of mellowing into it. And my yard, I got yard of the week. Of course, I had to print my own sign, but I got yard of the week where my landscaping looked really good and, and started looking at things that were important to me. And family and friends was very important. And we all know that we lost a very uh, wonderful gentleman, dentist, friend, mentor um, from Oklahoma City, Bill Lockard, who was part of our Panky cadre. We lost him to, to um, COVID, and I'm sure you've lost family and friends possibly, but I took away from that um, how important our relationships are, just like we talk about at Panky, and what are the important things in your life, and your health is one of them. Um, that's why when I get done here, my wife and I go walk our dogs and go take a run. Uh, what are you doing? What, what was your takeaway from COVID? And don't lose track of that now that things maybe, hopefully at some point in the future will get back to normal or some semblance of normal, you know, remember what you learned and apply those, those things to your life from here on out, because I'm telling you, um, there's no guarantees and we know we're all headed. Um, we're all headed down that path. So um, that's my takeaway. So we're going to talk a little bit about smiles and stuff and where do our patients get their information on smiles? They are, what they want to do, whether it's veneers or cosmetics or whatever. And I would propose to you that a lot of them get them from social media, whether that's right or wrong. And they're so they're exposed to it so much. And we so many dentists spend so much time in their social media and their search engine optimization and things like that. We're going to get to teeth. But I think it's real important to talk about, you know, 
where our patients are getting their information and what they want to do with things. How many of you ever saw the program? It was called um, Ultimate Makeover. And it was on, and it was on for, I think, for five years. And there was a big dental component in there in that uh, a dentist would take a patient. A lot of them, they would do instant orthodontics. They should have been the orthodontist, but they did the instant ortho, uh, orthodontics. And they did um, aggressive crown preps, and realigned teeth, made them look really good, and um, sent them on their way. And they did other things with, with tummy tucks and surgeries and things like that. And how many of you know the, the uh, sequel to that ultimate makeover television program uh, that followed uh, five years later? Anybody know? I would propose to you that it was ultimate do-over. They didn't have predictability. They were doing aggressive crown preps. They should have sent people to the orthodontist and done the right thing, but they were in such a hurry to get things done. It was ultimate do-over. A lot of those cases failed, I heard, um, that came out of California and stuff because of what they did. We want predictability in our dentistry. And what I'm gonna to talk to you about tonight will help with your predictability in your dentistry, whether it's composites or your occlusion on your appliance therapy, on your equilibrations, on your provisionals, and on your final restorations. I'm gonna to talk to you about a, a system um, that you need to ask for because your lab will not give it to you. They will not give it to you unless you ask for it and are specific in what you're looking for. And so we're going to talk about that. I graduated in 1981 from dental school. And if you'll do the math, this is 2021. I've been out of dental school 40 years. And I'm telling you, it, it's gone just like that. Just like that, it's gone. I can remember on the lower left, I started going to the Panky Institute in 1982. And I, these two guys, one from Big Spring, Texas, and one from Marietta, George, I met them and we started going through the continuum together. And um, so for Christmas presents, I had a photograph taken with all of us and I had it duplicated and I sent it to Dr. Pankey and I said, could you sign above Dickie Stanley's head, you know, and Ron, Ron Burton's head and then my head. And then whenever he sent me my picture, he, he kept a sticky note on there and he drew hair in. And so that was the kind of sense of humor that Dr. Pankey had. And so I was very fortunate to make lifelong friends like you all have done in those of you who've come through the continuum and um, still have lifelong friends that you can call. I talked to Ron Burton just the other day. He's retired, been retired for seven years. And um, we had a great conversation. It's like when you see these people that you become friends with, it's like you never miss a beat. You never miss a beat. But I was thinking as I was down at the Institute, you know, the, all the things that we're exposed to as a dentist, monolithic lithium basilicate, zirconium, Itero, CADCAM, Lucite re Reinforced Restorations, ICAT, CBCT, Felspathic Porcelain, Bilayered All Porcelain Restorations, Monolithic, X Generation Composite Bonding, Hybrid Composites, Nanofill Composites, Microfill Composites, Low Shrinkage, More Stuff, blah, 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 blah. So much information that we as dentists have to assimilate and to be an, uh, a really good, excellent dentist. And sometimes it can just be really overwhelming. I get that. And here, when we go, I've helped on the essential, on the, uh, one of the lead faculties at Essentials One at the Pank Institute. And I had a dentist to tell me, he need, and I, he was an instructor at the OU College of Dentistry. And he told me that but today's dental student gets about half the clinical experience and half the laboratory experience. And they did a study, Dr. Tom McGarry, who I ride bikes with, the past president of the American College of, of Prosthodontists, told me this. And he said, you know, it's just, um, it's interesting how our students are coming out. And then personal interviews on Panky, I help with the E1 Essential One classes and stuff. And what the students are exposed to nowadays compared to what we had in our, um, in our, uh, in our going through the Institute. And I'm trying to get this to my hands. Hang on one second. So here's a recent E1. It was the first class that came back after we were able to do COVID, um, after COVID wound down a little bit and we all wore masks and we socially distanced and now they're, they're gonna go back to masks because of the Delta, um, the Delta uh, virus, the Delta variant on the virus and so I had a, uh, one of the participants told me, he said, I've only prepared four crowns on live patients. 
She graduated from an accredited dental school, an upper Midwest accredited dental school. Four crowns on live patients. She said, I've watched a lot of crown preps though, but she's only done four herself. She has not done endo on a live patient. And that's what we're up against. And what we need to do is educating because we're all teachers. At some point, to whom much is given, much is expected, the panky we talk about. So we need to help train our next generation of dentists and stuff, no matter what you are. And if you're a young dentist, helping your classmates because helping your colleagues, and I said colleagues, not didn't I say that? Not competitors, but colleagues. Because we want to think of that any way we can to help our colleagues, not competitors. And if you have that kind of attitude, you'll go far. There I am in the upper right in the back of this E1 class. Um, just talked to Dylan. Dylan said they're having a TMD course right now. And he said they had uh, 40 people in the Institute last weekend with a dental assistant course. And so things are really looking good. And we're uh, very appreciative of our, our Panky Institute. I had the opportunity to give this speech to the American Equilibration Society and their mission statement was to be the leading organization of the dental professions advancing the science and clinical application of knowledge in occlusion, TMD, and comprehensive oral care for the well-being of those we serve. And I thought, you know what? We at the Panky Institute, we aspire to all of that also. And so we want to be up front and uh, we want to be the preeminent experts in occlusion. And what I've talked to you about tonight is not difficult stuff, but guess what? I don't see it in the crowds that I'm seeing people show when they show their cases and stuff. So I thought this was really good that we could aspire to do that in occlusion and TMD at our Panky Institute. Hang on. So I told you I was gonna show you teeth. So what about the patient that comes in? Here's Jim, and Jim is a retired dentist, and Jim is 85 years old. And I want you to look at his masseters on the lower left and look at the quality of those. And Jim sent his wife first, and I restored his wife. And his wife had come in, and she'd been wearing appliance therapy for 24 hours a day, and she came from a TM disorder uh, practice in Norman, Oklahoma, which is about 45 minutes south. And she'd been wearing appliance therapy, and he felt like that, um, the treating dentist felt like her back teeth needed to be built up and, and then she would be without an appliance and stuff. So she came in one day going from 24 hour appliance therapy to uh, we built up her back teeth and provisionals. And then she went to, to just wearing um, no night guard at night um, until we had another one made. And now I would do a quick split on her, but um, she tolerated the procedure very well and everything worked out great. And now she just wears an appliance at night a night guard more than anything, and she does, has done very, very well. Once we finished his wife, Jim came to me as a patient. He said, now you get to treat the tough one. And so you can see the severe wear that Jim had, and he had his nephew, who was a dentist in a small farming community about two hours west of Oklahoma City, had built him an overlay partial, as you can see in the lower right. And what's this got to do with what I'm talking about tonight? It's got everything to do with it, because when inclusion is going to be a big factor in this, when he, Jim, took that partial off, he would only hit his anterior teeth and his posterior teeth were not in occlusion. And so we had to look at, we took diagnostic models and photographs and we worked out the occlusion. We had to open his vertical dimension of occlusion for restorative purposes. And we were able to do that. And um, so I'll show you his case later. How about this case? This case, the gentleman, this is post-ortho. We had intruded his upper anterior teeth and his lower anterior teeth whenever we had him before. This is him coming out of ortho and we're getting her to restore his teeth. And we also had to open his um, vertical dimension of occlusion for restorative space in his case. But his occlusion too, the same thing. What I'm gonna to talk to you about tonight, cuss tips and re-engineered flat landing pads is making a huge difference in his case. I saw him the other day and he's doing very, very well and uh, he loves his treatment and stuff. But what I'm talking about is a simple, simple, simple way to do things. But I don't see people talking about it to their lab. And when I talked to the lab, I said, does anybody put this in their scripts? And they said, no. And unless you put it in your scripts, you're, they're not gonna put that down, especially as lab technicians become fewer and fewer trained lab technicians um, because they're gonna go off a library of images 
to pull off the computer as we go to CAD CAM technology. How many enjoy cutting zirconium and lithium to silica crowns? Wouldn't we like to get the occlusion right from the beginning and decrease the fact that we decrease the number of restorations we have to cut off because something's wrong or something's not right, especially zirconium. I don't know about you, but I've heard everything from thin diamonds to thick diamonds to diamond wheels to, to very fine diamonds to coarse diamonds. And so whatever way you cut your zirconium or your lithium to silica crowns off, it's not fun. I think it, everybody would, would agree with that. And um, so I took this picture, Jim Kessler wanted this picture. So I sent this to him as he talks about zirconium, whether you're pro-zirconium or, or anti-zirconium. But you know what? When we start talking about dentistry, a lot of times it gets back to very, very simple things. No matter how fancy the football game is, whether it's the Dallas Cowboys and the New York Giants, it gets that back to X's and O's and blocking and tackling, doesn't it? X's and O's, how you draw it up. It gets down to the basics of blocking, blocking and tackling in football. And I think there's some very simple basics in dentistry that we can undertake and do that will improve the predictability and the quality of our restoration. What I talked to you about tonight, I'm convinced will decrease the rate of fractures of your porcelain. And I'll show you why. And we've talked about physics of forces here before long. Albert Einstein, that's what he had to say. He thinks we can do things in simple ways. And I'm all about being simple. I'm a slow kid from, from Oklahoma. So let's talk a little bit about occlusal camps. Because right now in dental schools around the country, there are five different occlusal camps being taught. And let's talk about the first one. The first one is the conformist. The conformist is the one that they don't believe in occlusion. They think that um, you want to duplicate what they've had. They don't want to alter, uh, alter the anterior guidance. And so they, they believe in uh, maximum intercuspation. And I'm not saying that if you treat to maximum intercuspation that you're a conformist. I'm not saying that. Did you hear me? But they just keep, they want to keep things as simple as possible and they want to keep uh, where they don't change anything. Then we have your Panky Dawson, where we talk about centric relation. We talk about anterior guidance and Panky Dawson. They don't have to be the same. The angle of, of the uh, eminence of the, the conroy eminence does not have to be the same as the angle of the anterior guidance. And they believe in centric relation. Nathology, in nathology, they believe in tripodization of contacts. In nathology, they believe in the angle of the eminence should be a similar angle to the angle of the anterior guidance. And those should be similar, they feel like. Then you have the neuromuscular group. In the neuromuscular camp, they believe in using the TENS unit and it's more of a muscle brace position. And uh, on average, a condyle is forward and down a millimeter out of the definition of a centric relation that Panky Dawson talks about. And then you have your bioesthetics people. And the bioesthetics control your vertical dimension where they measure between the CEJ of the upper and the CEJ of the lower. And they have um, standard, uh, they have standard numbers that they use or, or have some variables in there, but they can use that as their guide for vertical dimension of occlusion. And those are currently the five different camps that are being taught in our dental schools around the country. So let's talk about the three controversies in the three different, uh, in the camps that they have, the difference between the different occlusal camps. The first one is the maxillomandibular relationship, where the condyles are. The second one is the vertical dimension of occlusion. And the third is the envelope of function. And that's where the, the anterior guidance they create. Let's talk about the first one. So occlusal controversy occurs in three areas. And the first area is maxillomandibular relationship, where the condyles are. If you look at this histological image of the condyle on the left, central relation, the condyle is seated uppermost, midmost, and has an anterior vector component, slight anterior vector component that follows the direction of the masseter muscle. And the condyle disc assembly is healthy and it's in the right position. And if the condyle is seated, 
The difference between that and say, for instance, the neuromuscular camp, the neuromuscular camp would use a TENS unit. And when they do that, the condyle is on average down a millimeter and forward a millimeter. And so it's a different, it's a different condylar position than what centric relation is. And that's the difference in number one, the maximal mandibular relationship between two different camps, the Peggy Dawson camp and, and also the nathology camp versus the neuromuscular camp. How about the second one? The second one is the vertical dimension of occlusion. The bioesthetic people think that you take measurements between the CEJ and CEJ, and they have parameters that they use to determine how far open or closed your vertical dimension um, of occlusion is. And that difference differs between the other occlusal camps that don't use that as a reference point. Number three, the third place that controversy occurs is the envelope of function. Nathologists believe that the angle of the eminence should be similar in the anterior guidance it's created, whereas the Panky Dawson people think that the two are not related. You can have a different angle on the eminence than your angle that you create in your anterior guidance. And so they can be different, whereas the mythology people believe that they should be closer to the similar or same. So that's the differences between the different camps right there. What about similarities? Every occlusal camp, did you hear this? Every occlusal camp, every occlusal camp, when the patient closes, all the back teeth should touch at once. All the back teeth should touch at once. When a patient moves their jaw, no back teeth should interfere. Every occlusal camp agrees on that. Don't you remember that? Look at that. Think about that. So there are no open spaces in the back teeth. Whatever condylar position you choose, all the teeth need to touch. Whatever vertical dimension you touch, all the back teeth should touch. That's important. But the important stuff is what a patient does their occlusion or malocclusion is more important than the occlusion itself. How many of you ever had a patient, you, you know you could put a two by four between their teeth and say, how does that feel? And they go, yeah, that feels great. And then how many of you had the patient who's occlusally aware you could put a thickness of a human hair between their teeth and go, ah, oh, it feels a little high over the sun side. You've ever had that patient, they'll drive you crazy, won't they? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? I can't see it, but I know you're shaking your head. So the important stuff is what they do to their occlusion. That's more important than how their occlusion looks. And if they do anything with it, then guess what? In my opinion, the reason we talk about centric relation at Panky Institute is because that's important and how they do it, if, what they do with their teeth. That's my wife and that's my son there. And we're Oklahoma State Cowboy fans. And the simple test, whether what kind of, a, what occlusal camp you choose, is can you apply the occlusal philosophy to every patient in your practice? And you, can you apply it without the need to restore any teeth? Because if you want it to work in your office, it needs to work for patients that are not doing reconstructions. What do we mean by that? Patient comes in, if you had a 24 year old daughter, she comes in and you do, TENS unit and your condylar inclination or your condyles are down a millimeter forward of a millimeter, where are the back teeth going to be? Back teeth are going to be apart, aren't they? So what do we talk about? All the occlusal camps have in common. All the back teeth should touch. Now all of a sudden, you're going to have to do some restorations on posterior teeth or orthodontics to pull those teeth together. How many of you seen those throwaway journals where they're bonding on onlays on posterior teeth to get teeth in contact? Because you have to restore it. If you open the vertical, you have to restore at least one arch of teeth, right? Okay, so you're gonna you're gonna bond those on. What if that's your daughter and she has virgin teeth? Are you gonna bond on 24 restorations or 16 restorations? Because if you wouldn't do it on your daughter, but you do it on my daughter, you got an ethical dilemma there, in my opinion. Don't you? You got an ethical dilemma. If you wouldn't do it on your own family members, I heard Pete Dawson always call it the Whittium rule. Would I do it on me? Would I do it on my family? If you wouldn't do it on your wife or your son, would you do it on my wife or my son? Hopefully the answer is the same, right? So for that reason alone, you can, it helps you decide which occlusal camp you want to be involved in. And I, 
chose Panky Dawson for that simple reason right there. My dad was a fighter pilot in the Air Force, and he flew 5,600 hours in the F-4, which is the, at that time was the hot plane. And I said, Dad, how did you do it? And he goes, I'd always get my checklist out. I'd always go through my checklist. I'm a checklist kind of person. Other dentists, like Guy Haddix out of North Carolina, he wasn't a checklist person. He could pull out a blank sheet of paper, and he could go through that, and he could pull things out and talk to patients. And he had a – his system was different than my system. So – we talk about systems. We talk about what I'm going to get ready to talk about here. I want to show you this system. What is that? That's a fence post. What is that? If you've ever been to the farm, that's a fence post. Put her in her. <laughs> and what you do is you put slide that over that, that fence post and you start banging on it and it goes in. So back in the farm, when my dad went to Vietnam, we moved in the family farm that my granddad was on. And we'd put fence in and we'd have to go take it out because we put it in the wrong position. How do you get fence post out? You just lift it up. No, you wiggle it back and forth. And I would propose to you that teeth are the same way. And when they get angular motion, lateral back and forth, lateral forces, they become loose sometimes. If the bone um, allows it, and then the tooth becomes loose, and then you have problems. Right? Simple analogy right there. Wiggling the fence post out, teeth are the same way. I saw this on social media. This came from an Italian dentist. And I looked at those and he posted those and he was really proud of them. And I, th I think they, they look beautiful. My question to him is in your occlusal scheme, you might be able to do tripodization contacts or you might be able to have contacts on cuss tips, but look at all the grooves and stuff, supplemental anatomy in that. You want that in your crowns because you're going to be describing that to your, to your technician. How many of you had patients go, why is that crown so rough? It feels rough to my tongue. How many of you had that? I know. Go ahead. Shake your head. Yes. It happens. I talked to Jim Kessler. We all know Jim Kessler. He was our uh, past executive uh, or uh, head of education and past president of the American Academy of Restorative Dentistry. He told me, he says, Jeff, I was talking about anatomy and about flat landing pads, my, my topic. He said, I spent the first half of my career putting lots of anatomy in. And he said, the sec second half has been taking it out. And he's a believer also in flat landing pads and contacts on cuss tips, which is what I'm getting to. There are three types of centric holding contacts, surface to surface contacts. And that's back in dental school days when you were waxing the crown, you would heat it up and you would close the articulator in and then you would go from there and you had lots of excursive interferences. The next one is the tripod contacts that we talk about in pathology. And if you will look at a, um, a set of teeth that have tripod contacts drawn in there, I'm going to show you one here in a minute. They'll drive you crazy, I would propose to you. And the last one that I'm really going to talk about is the cuss tip to fossa contacts. And I want you to start being more, or if you see a benefit in what I'm talking about, start being more um, direct with your lab about that's the kind of contacts you want in your crowns. So let's talk about cuss tip to fossa contacts. And if I had one picture that I could show you that would summarize my talk, it would be this crown, this Emacs crown on the lower left. You can still have grooves. You can still make them look like natural teeth and you can still function just fine. But yet, if you look at that, on that mesial marginal ridge on the left, you see a flat landing pad. On the central fossa right down the middle, there's a flat landing pad. On the marginal ridge on the right, there's a flat landing pad. And then the mesolingual cusp on the inside, the contact is on the cusp tip. It's not going around the side. That, my friends, is the grooves off of those flat landing pads. That's what I'm talking about. And that's what we've talked about at Panky forever. And by doing this, it will make a more stable contact. And I'm gonna show you here in a minute why. Let's talk about the physics of forces. I'm gonna break down, I had a, got together with a physics professor and we did a force analogy, the physics of forces, we did a study and we looked at inclines and what the, when they break down a component force of vec, into vectors, you get a lateral component and a vertical component. And I would propose to you, that because porcelain does better under uh, compression rather than tension or shear, that the lateral forces are the bad guys and the vertical forces are the good guys. In other words, directing forces down the long axis of the tooth. And so in this study with Dr. Martin, a PhD in physics at the University of Central Oklahoma, we studied these contacts on inclines. And this is what we came up with. 
conclusion. We took teeth and then we measured these cusp angles and stuff. And if you'll look in the left, the red box is the, I'm gonna show you that in the middle here. On the right, we're going to measure that cusp angle and how an upper upper cusp, when it hits it in a certain direction, what that breaks down to as far as lateral forces and vertical forces. And the cusp angle, you can see the cusp angle. So let's start out with a small one, a 25 degree cusp angle. And that red, I mean, the red angle on the left is the yellow on the right, and that actually is 25 degrees. That doesn't look very steep to me when I look at that. And I don't know what your first impression is and when you look at that, but that's 25 degree cusp angle. And that's pretty shallow, isn't it? So 27% of forces on when a contact hits on an incline like that are directed laterally and 73% of the forces are directed vertically, which is what we want. We want the vertical forces because we want long axis loading, okay? Long axis loading. How about if we go to a 40 degree cusp? So that's a 40 degree angle on the left and on the yellow on the right, that's a 40 degree angle. And if you have a contact hitting on that incline at 40 degrees like that, 44% of lateral forces, 56% of vertical forces. So the lateral forces are the bad guys and the 56% are the good guys. So as the cusp angle increases, and you get an incline interference, it puts more lateral pressures, more likely to shear your porcelain and it cause a failure in your crown. How about a 70 degree angle? You get a really steep cusp. 70 degree angle, that's a 70 degree angle on the left and the red, and also in the yellow on the right, that's a 70 degree angle. 77% of those lateral forces are directed laterally and only 23% are directed vertically. And so there's a great, great shear and uh, tension component in any incline uh, forces you have applied on that tooth or on that porcelain. So the lateral forces are the bad guys. Let's talk about force analysis. When you do vertical loading of teeth, what you'd like to see, the yellow is the periodontal ligament. Look at the angle that the fibers go. They're like a sling and they help hold a tooth. And so that sling, the black marks or the angles when you look at a cross section, a histological section of periodontal ligaments, that's how it looks. So it's a sling. If you get vertical loading of a tooth, that's the way it was meant. Look at the pressure that you get in blue at the bottom. And it's going to make that tooth a lot stronger and less apt to get a, a lateral component and either fracture or become loose versus an off angle loading, like I showed you before. Look at where the pressure is and how much different the tension is on the ligament in a off angle loading on the right. I don't, I don't take teeth out. All I do is restore to dentistry, but I think it's good to look at extracted teeth. I thank Dr. Uh, Ed Wilson uh, for these teeth from the OU College of Dentistry. Well, I mean, well, actually I only got the first premolar. He was screaming so much, I couldn't get the rest of them out. I had to go elsewhere. That was a joke, so. <laughs> But look at teeth, and we want to do long axis loading. Now, I know lower teeth, mandibular teeth, have a little slightly lingual incline, and then upper teeth have a slightly, uh, or lingual incline in the upper, and a um, they're not straight up and down in the mandible and stuff. But long axis loading is what we're looking for. Same thing that upper premolars, second premolars. I don't take teeth out, but when you look at them, we want long axis loading on our on our teeth. So let's talk about forces. Porcelain does better under compression than tension and shearing forces. And what we're talking about doing is drawing from Jim Kessler. On the left, you can see, look where the contacts are. We want to do long axis loading and not contacts on inclines because compression forces, porcelain does better than shearing forces. Okay? Like this. So we remove the inclines and we have near misses and we have long axis loading. This picture is from uh, Jim Kessler and uh, Mike Fling talks about it in the envelope of pair function in study club, uh, Seattle Study Club journal article. And just like the Thunderbirds, my dad told you he was in the Air Force, he was wing commander with the Thunderbirds, he didn't fly with them, but they, they were a squadron underneath him. And just like in the Thunderbirds, we're gonna do long axis loading 
We're talking about the envelope of function and pair of function and how they go side to side. Contacts on cuss tips and flat landing pads, just like the Thunderbirds, you either hit or you don't hit. Cusp either hits on it as it moves out to the side or they don't hit, just like the Thunderbirds. So I'm gonna to propose to you that our occlusal schemes, that we do this in our occlusal schemes and how we address it to our lab. So here's a question for you. Which contact hits the hardest, left or right? Okay, think about it, look at it. Now I'm gonna to pose to you, that's a trick question because you see, this is dependent on the size of the cusp and a molar is gonna have a bigger cusp and might leave a bigger mark. The lingual mark on a premolar with a, with a more pointed cusp might leave a smaller mark. Here's another one. Another question, which cusp hits harder, the left one or the right one? And I would propose to you that the left one does because it wipes the ink away. Right? Right. Now, T-scan, I've got a T-scan and I'm in the process of learning. I'm a slow kid from Oklahoma, so the learning curve is a steep one for me, but I'm learning it. And what do you learn from the, what I've taken away from my time with the, uh, with it is that um, the size of the contact point, you can't always tell that that's the hardest hitting contact point. And so the balance in a T-scan is what we're, we're looking for in our equilibrations and I'm learning and growing. And so some of you may have T-scans. If you don't, don't feel bad about it. You can still equilibrate. You can still do all the dentistry you wanna do. And I'm learning and growing with this T-scan. So um, I think dentistry is moving that way a lot in certain um, aspects, especially in appliance therapy when you finish and testing the appliance and then finalizing your equilibrations and stuff. A lot of very, very smart dentists, um, some study clubs that I know that, that utilize this and are really efficient at it. I'm trying to learn and grow that way. How big do you make the landing pads? We talk about landing pads. How big do you make them? This was a lab and this was a, uh, this was Summit Lab out of Waco, Texas. Who he was a student, uh, in my um, an E1 that I helped teach. And um, so he would go and he would locate those cuss tips, the flat landing pads. And this happened to be my Panky Scholar case. And he showed, he took pictures of the wax up and how he was doing it. And it worked out great. I'm gonna show you this case later. So the question is how big do you make the landing pads? And the answer is, well, that depends. What does it depend on? Well, you've heard Mike Fling talk about cows and gators. And a cow is more of a horizontal chewer. A gator is more of a vertical chewer. A horizontal chewer is going to need a larger landing pad before it gets into interferences. A vertical chewer is not going to need as big a landing pad. What's an analogy? I told you my dad was a fighter pilot. How about analogy? How about an aircraft carrier versus a vertical takeoff plane? The Harrier jet on the right. Plane comes in on a carrier needs a larger landing pad than the one that the vertical takeoff on a Harrier jet or even the new, the Ospreys or the F-35s that are coming out. That plane on the right can take off straight up so it doesn't need a very big landing pad. One that lands on the carrier needs a larger landing pad. And so it all depends on whether they're horizontal or vertical chewers. Mike Fling has talked about that and talks about that in his wear, wear courses. How about your Syriac occlusal schemes? I don't have a Syriac machine, uh, but this was from a, a, a dentist in Edmond here. And uh, I was talking to her about occlusion and I said, well, instead of a tripodization of contacts, why don't you make a flat landing pad? And I think the flat landing pad on the right side is, is a little big, but you can do these occlusal schemes that we're talking about, even if you have a Syriac machine and you do CAD CAM dentistry in your office. Look at how you propose and how you pull up an image out of your library of images and then alter it to where you have a flat landing pass on marginal ridges and you go to cuss tips. So you can do that in your CAD CAM dentistry with the Syriac machines. Am I clear on that? This came out of social media also at an Italian dentist and he was real proud. He posted this picture and I'm assuming that he, that, that was not just on the articulator that he went to the mouth and marked those. And what I noticed about it was it's tripodization of contacts. And again, we talked about incline contacts and I'm gonna circle Look at, the, look at the two sets of three right there, okay? 
So in the central fossa, he's got a con three contacts on inclines, which is the way I was taught it when I was in dental school. And my dental school faculty was Herb Schillenberg. Herb Schillenberg could probably do this. Most of the rest of us is probably make an alcoholic because trying to get contacts like that lined up even and balanced. What happens if you lose one of those contacts? What happens in the three down that central fossa if you lose one of those contacts? And I would propose to you, you now have a contact on an, inter, on an incline, which in Oklahoma, we call that an interference. And so why not simplify things? We talked about young dental students are coming out only doing four crowns. Let's talk about a different occlusal scheme that's much simpler to teach and much simpler for us to do, and it can improve our dentistry. So I see this posted also, and they do tripodization of contacts. Remember on the left side, that picture in the yellow that there, as the, as the cusp get closer to the fulcrum, the cusp get sh the shallower. The teeth get moved back and get closer to the fulcrum. A second molar is going to have shallower cusp, more shallow than you can have maybe on a, on a first bicuspid. And so I would propose to you that instead of doing the left occlusal scheme like that A, that we do B, that we have flat landing pads, and think how much simpler that is to do, to teach and to do ourselves personally. We have less shearing forces, more compressive forces on the porcelain, less fractures of porcelain, decrease the remakes, just save the cost of the course, even though it's free. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about applications. How about applications of your appliance therapy? Don't we do that? Don't we have flat landing pads on our appliance therapy? And then we take that and we do our provisionals that way. We do equilibrations that way, right? And then we do go to the final restorations. We want to duplicate what we're trying to get. Have the condyle seated as much as possible in central relation. If you show choose to do central relation right then, not every case I treat is in central relation. There are some that are in maximum intercuspation. And I'm sure just like in your practice too. Here's a case on a collaboration. Here's before, gentleman that came to me for treatment. There's all the interfer interferences. You have uh, um, non-working and working interferences that are present. And then we collaborated his teeth and we go from here's before to here's after. Contacts on cuss tips and flat landing pads. So we tried things on, on uh, Appliance therapy, then we equilibrated the case and we were able to get flat landing pad contacts and contacts on cuss tips. And then we can do our dentistry that we want to, to do at a stable position. How about using this occlusal scheme and then restorative treatment, like composite restorations. If you don't have a contact you want, add a, a occlusal stop in composite. Look at number, um, number three there. I'm going to circle it here. That's a composite contact that I had just to get me a, a, a stable occlusal contact, right? Okay. So here was another dentist came to me from a farming community about two hours away and he wanted to restore his teeth. And uh, he'd been to an excellent dentist before that. Um, and he'd had some crowns done 25 years before. And he was wanting, he had some wear on his lower anterior teeth. When he closed his teeth together, the linguals of those upper crowns touched the lower and sizable edges that so we were, uh, had to open his vertical in his case too. And, uh, but we waxed the case up. We knew what we we're going to do. And uh, so we were able to work it out on the articulator. He had appliance therapy. Fast forward, we were testing our occlusal schemes. We did it uh, lower anteriors, upper anteriors, lower posteriors, and now the upper posteriors. So we finalized already the lower, the lower arch and his upper anteriors are done. We have the anterior guidance scheme that we want and we have stable posterior contacts on composite there. And we tested it and he was stable for four months. And then we re-waxed the case doing flat landing pads, as you can tell on the left. That's the day of prep. We prepped the teeth. We retested the occlusal scheme in our final provisionals. So we had contact points that we knew we had a good stable mounting, stable on his provisionals. We worked all that out. Then we took off the posterior restorations, took bite records. Then we took off the premolars. That was our vertical stop to control our vertical dimension right there. We took bite records over the prepared teeth. 
And then we made our final restorations, just like we've done our provisionals. If you look on the, the crowns on the lower, on the upper left, look on number 15 back there and you can see flat landing pads, flat landing pads on the gold crowns. We do gold in Oklahoma and he wanted it on his, on his first and second molars. We did three quarter crowns on the, on the uh, um, first molars. And then we did contacts on flat landing pads on his bicuspids. If you haven't seen this, this is the new Luxa crown. I heard about this from Mike Plain. And um, this is stronger, a lot stronger than Luxa temp. And when you're opening vertical cases and stuff, this is a great material. DMG, it's a little bit more expensive than Luxa temp, but this is a great material. They've just released it from Europe here in the last year. And if you're not doing using uh, Luxa crown, I would highly encourage you to get that. It comes in different shades and stuff. They have bleach white too now, I think. Um, and we, we utilize that, especially on, when we're opening vertical dimension of occlusion, um, either composite or using Luxa crown, depending on the case. And I would highly encourage you, that's a great material. I have no ties to anybody, any lab, any material company, so. And then here's crowns, we do gold crowns, I told you. If you look at the upper left one or the left one, you can see the flat landing pads on the marginal ridges, and you can see on cusp tips, that's the case, the same one I showed you before, the monolithic lithium disilicate crown, where I have contacts on flat landing pads that are spaced out through there. And you can still have grooves come off these landing pads and they can still look like teeth. And then last but not least, the lower right's a lower premolar that um, I have contacts on the marginal ridges. And where do you put the contacts? Where the opposing teeth are, or unless you're gonna change them. Where they go, that's where I put the, the landing pads. And then we have grooves come off those landing pads. It, it, that's the way we address that when we talk to the lab, how we want our, our occlusal schemes to come back. Here's a crown I got back from a, a, a lab and, and I thought maybe we were doing too long pretty well. I'm gonna draw in the yellow dots where the occlusal scheme is and I'm gonna show you the problem I have with this. So look at that crown right there and look at that groove from the mesial uh, marginal ridge back to the central fossa. Okay, so here's my contacts. Basically what he's done, he's got a contact in the buccal incline, the lingual incline, and it's, it's, a, it's a two contact, it's not a tripodization, or maybe a little bit close to tripod. And he put the groove right down through the middle. I'm going, that's where you ought to have your flat landing pad. There shouldn't be a groove. The groove can come off the side, either side of that landing pad. And then I had the cuss tip, did okay on the, on the central fossa back towards the distal, um, that triangular ridge going across there and the lingual, but he put the, the groove right through the middle where my, where my groove ought to be. And I also have, ought to have a contact on that mesial marginal ridge if I can do that. And then you'll look at the, in the, uh, some of the journals and look at the, the anatomy and some of these teeth they're talking about. And I would propose to you that there's a lot of places you can put flat landing pads and still look like teeth and function so much better and decrease your porcelain fractures if you have any problems with that. How about plunger cusp? One of the major mistakes I see general dentists making, Dr. Tom McGarry said when we were talking one day, he said, they don't look at the opposing arch enough and they don't correct for, for some things like a plunger cusp. Correct the plunger cusp. Don't make a sway back bridge or a crown on the bottom. Correct the occlusion on the opposing arch if you're going to do some uh, crown and bridge and get that just right. And then you're ready to make your restorations that fit in harmony with that. How about lateral pole changes and medial pole changes? You see lateral pole changes. I had a patient lady came in and her occlusion was stable for over 20 years. And all of a sudden she came in and she started picking up as she slid around. I said, my bike feels different when I slide around. Well, she was having some arthritic changes going on in her lateral pole. And 95% of pathology occurs in the lateral pole. And so where would you see that? You see it in the excursive interferences. She started picking up some excursive interference that she didn't have before. And I knew she was having some arthritis going on other joints. Sure enough, in that joint she did too. What about medial pole changes? If you see arthritic changes going on the medial pole, where are you gonna see the changes? Where well, are you gonna see them in the centric stops? All of a sudden she came in and guess what? My bike feels heavier on this right side than it does on the other side. Well, she was starting to have some arthritic changes going on on her medial pole and then would show up in her centric stops and also in excursions too. So we had to address that. Think about that. And when you look at the radiographs, look at that condyle on the right side. The left one's normal, right and left. Look at the arthritic changes going on, not only the lateral pole, but the medial pole. Where would you see changes? Well, her bite would be different, not only in centric stops, 
but also in her lateral excursions. And those are things we need to talk to our patients about. Right? Right. So lateral and medial pole arthritic changes and effects on trop trop occlusal context. If you got tropidization of context and you close down and all of a sudden you have a medial pole or a lateral pole change and maybe the tooth shifts over just a little bit, which is gonna be easier to adjust when you have tripodization of contacts like this, or Mike would propose to you that if you had a flat landing pad, that that, con that tooth may just shift over on a flat place, it has a greater chance of just shifting over a little bit without picking up an interference if you have flat landing pads and if that's how you set up your occlusal scheme. So in summary, we discussed the benefits of using a simple occlusal scheme utilizing cusp to fossa contacts and all aspects of your dentistry, whether it's an appliance therapy, whether it's a cool abrasion, whether it's composites, whether it's crown and bridge or provisionals. We showed a force analysis that showed favorable force distribution along the long axis of the teeth and maximum intercuspation using this approach. In other words, if you contacts hit on flat landing spat, uh, pads and using cuss tips rather than tripodization of contacts around a cuss tip, you're going to have long axis loading on the teeth and you're going to have less chance of mobility, less chance of fractures of teeth and porcelain or restorations, in my opinion. And last but not least, lab technicians need to be informed of the dentist desire to use this type of occlusal scheme. Don't assume they will utilize it because I showed you picture after picture that they're posting on social media and they're not doing it. And guess what? Unless your lab technician knows what are you looking for in your occlusion, they're not going to put it in there because they're pulling images now. And the, the more uh, fewer and fewer lab schools there are training facilities, the more they're going to go to library of images that have all those grooves in there and they don't have any tripodization of contacts. And you, they have to go in there and alter just a little bit to pick up those flat landing pads.